um, really security trends in general, but a lot of that involves our web applications. We're going to talk in specific about that. A little about, about me. Um, I founded my own business back in 96, been running that ever since, an independent consultant. Started the OWASP chapter up in Rochester in 2004. Um, I was also one of the founding members of the Rochester ISA chapter, and I'm here today to support the Southern Tier New York uh, ISA chapter to help, help them with the, their presentation and with, the, with their table as well. So uh, I started really in application development, and then I kind of moved toward network security, because I mean, network security is kind of an emerging field, late 90s or so, you know, um, which started to realize that, hey, this is a big deal. Um, in fact, I really started getting interested back in 88, 89, when we had the Morris Forum. Um, but still, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't enough uh, jobs in it, and there wasn't really a field yet. So I moved from application development to network security, and now kind of back into application security, the merger of the two. Uh, and I think application security is really where it's at. Um, and you'll see why when you look at the trends and where things are going, because applications are going to be the most difficult thing for us to protect. I've also done a lot of work for the CIS Center for Internet Security, with helping them develop their standards. And of course, training, incident handling, ethical hacking, lots of cool stuff. So the agenda for today is we're going to talk about security trends. In particular, we're going to talk about what the Black Hats are doing, um, how their black market is working, we'll on some of the pricing, some types of attacks they're uh, focusing on these days, um, some trends and what they're targeting, and then we're going to web application vulnerabilities um, and why they're important and why this is part of the overall trend. Uh, a little bit about web application defenses, um, then we're going to talk about client-side attacks. So if you haven't guessed, a couple of the major trends are going to be web applications and client-side uh, attacks. Um, we'll get more into that in the next few slides. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, the trends, the motivation for hacking has changed, right? It used to be kind of fun and easy and you do it for notoriety. Uh, but these days, the, uh, the black hats are making money and making a living off from this. And so that's been their motivation for some time now. Um, they're getting involved with organized crime. There's actually been a few cases where someone that was a known hacker winds up getting, you know, executed style in, in, in their home, you know, and, and the, the rumor is that they, uh, they told the organized crime they didn't want to be involved anymore with them, and, and th that wasn't an option, apparently. So, I mean, there's, you know, even the bad guys uh, wind up uh, hurting each other, right? Because there, there's, no, uh, there's no honor among thieves. Um, they're developing into coordinated teams. A lot of them have rather specialized skills. You know, someone that's specialized in uh, developing spam to be able to get through the spam filters. Someone else is good at just getting a lot of uh, systems compromised and forming a good, a large botnet. Uh, others that are better at phishing and, and targeted attacks. So you get those skills together in a coordinated team, they all work together um, and then uh, work as a team together to compromise systems with a common goal. Um, of course, how well they work together sometimes can be fairly professional uh, in some way that we would hope to work together. But a lot of times there's a lot of, you know, bickering side, you know, competition, um, you know, backstabbing and, and that kind of thing as well. Uh, we saw some of that with Anonymous and Lusak recently, right? Um, we got one of the anonymous uh, leaders to uh, turn on some of the other ones. <clears throat> so uh, a lot of, again, uh, specialized services, stealthier attacks, we're going to talk about some of the stealthier ones, um, and also the, you know, the older things like defacing a website, that's not fun anymore. In fact, when I do a web application audit or something, I'll find in there um, traces of the attacker. They might even leave a calling card, so there's a special page say, you know, hacked by, you know, uh, code blue or whatever, you know, his, his hacker name is, you know, hacked by the best. And he'll put his little calling card in there, but there's no link to that. So unless you know, know it's there, you know to look for it. So that kind of gives him a way of saying, hey, look, I can give you a, a thousand URLs of web applications I've hacked. And, you know, so he's got his bragging rights, but it's not quite as obvious to the people that own the website, right, that their website's been hacked because there's nothing changed as far as the normal web, web application goes. Any thoughts, questions? I want to hit questions as we go along. So if you have some, just raise your hand, flag me down. So how much hacking have you done? Ethical hacking. Um, a fair amount over the last four or five years. More pen testing would be a form of ethical hacking. And unethical um, hacking? Pardon? And unethical hacking in, unethical you, in hacking. your younger no. days. No, I've, I've been ethical from the start. Oh. I have always had a career, and, and, and it became obvious to me that, you know, hey, you don't want to, you know, after you've been in your career for a while, you're, you're not going to, you know, risk everything you've worked for uh, to do something that uh, could put you in jail. <clears throat> so, uh, some more trends, um, you know, large and growing market. It's like this black market for the black hats, right? Where they can trade their wares, sell their services. Hey, I've got a botnet, you know, and you can rent out this botnet. Um, some of the tools they use, they actually sell out um, tools, like MPAC, can you can buy for like $500 to $1,000. And when you buy this, you get a service agreement with it. Say, hey, we'll support it for you. We can give you updates. Um, 
poison ivy, Zeus by eye the same way. And what they'll do is they'll say, hey, look at if the malware is detected by the antivirus test, we can update it and make sure it won't be detected. And we actually get like a service level agreement um, from the bad guys. <laughs> so it's, it's really getting to be kind of a, you know, a somewhat professional in, in the black hat sort of way, uh, service level agreements. <clears throat> um, Poison Ivy has like a free version that's out there and you can download that, but it's kind of old. It really hasn't been updated in several years. Uh, but if you pay for it, you get a newer version that's been updated. Also, he has like a packer, which kind of hides it from the antivirus, and it's pretty effective. Uh, in fact, Poison Ivy is uh, the one that was used in the RSA breach. Um, and actually, I've seen it used in breaches as well. It doesn't get nearly as much uh, media press as Zeus and Spy Eye. And Zeus and Spy Eye are really sophisticated. I mean, they're, they're kind of the, uh, um, I don't know if you want to call them the Lamborghini of the mail. <laughs> uh, but other than Stuck Snack, I suppose, is, is uh, even a whole category by itself. So any thoughts, questions as we go? <clears throat> All right, so uh, again, services that are available, they'll build up these botnets, say, hey, look, we can use our botnet to generate spam for you, to send out spam, maybe to do click fraud. Uh, that's another one that's big. So there's a lot of things you can use these botnets for. Uh, DOS attacks, DDoS attacks, of course, are a big one. Um, so they'll do these um, services and then sell a specific Black Hat service that becomes part of an overall attack, okay? Um, but as they get better at doing these, and it's easier and easier to compromise system, and easier and easier to get credit card uh, fraudulently, the prices start going down as two, right? So just like any other economy. So you start seeing the prices back in 2005 for uh, a credit card with full identity was like 100 to $150. And then dropped down to about 14 to $18 in 2008. And now it's, you know, a buck or, or so, you know? Um, and they might sell 1,000, 10,000 of these at a, at a time. <clears throat> Um, they've estimated the size of the black hat black market to be about five to ten billion. So there's a lot of money out there. <clears throat> so and it's obviously growing very rapidly. It's something that's, you know, I think a lot of the motivation too is a lot of this is coming from countries that don't have a good economy, right? Um, they can get into a, a black hat thing like in Romania or some of the Eastern European countries. Um, and they can get what they consider to be a decent living, a better living than they could have getting a legitimate job. So that makes it a little harder to, uh, um, to explain the, the value of having an ethical job versus an unethical job, right? Because the money, at least in those countries, is a lot better than the ethical job. Um, <clears throat> the, the guy, the uh, Cebu, um, who was the, the anonymous guy who was arrested in New York City. I mean, he was living in a small apartment. It was a New York City apartment, but he wasn't really living high in the life either, you know? So, um, not all of them are really living, uh, you know, the, the, the ritzy life. And if they were, they'd probably be easier to catch, right? Because they kind of follow the money and say, hey, this guy's suddenly spending a lot of money, whereas he didn't have it before. Where's that money coming from? And that's the other thing I find interesting about the news stories about these guys is that um, a lot of catching these guys involves old-fashioned police work. I mean, the, the cyber skills are needed there, right? I mean, you have to understand about um, how to trace the connection, how to trace the IP address back to them. Uh, and this particular guy was using anonymizers for a long time. They had his code name, um, and then someone leaked his real name, which wasn't real evident, but they kind of suspected, you know, we think this person is linked to this code name. And then finally he connected to one chat room without using an anonymizer. So they had his real IP address, and they tracked it, tracked that back to, to find him in his apartment. Uh, and now they had evidence to uh, get a search warrant, and once they have the search warrant, they have the real evidence to prosecute him. So, you know, again, a lot of it's real old-fashioned place for it. And then once they get them, they say, hey, look at you know, you're not going to be able to have visitation rights for your kid, you're going to go to jail, so you better turn in the other guys, or, 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 <laughs> right? And so it's the old-fashioned good cop, bad cop type techniques um, that have worked all along. So uh, let's go on to other trends. Pump and dump schemes, they're still, you know, they only have to work for like 1% of the emails that go out, or even less than that, even a half percent, uh, to be effective. So they still are out there, not as heavy as they were uh, a few years ago. Uh, advertisement click fraud. Um, basically what you do there is um, you'll have a botnet and you say, hey, I've got this website, it gets lots of traffic, and sell the uh, advertisements, um, usually through a, a, a third party company, and they put ads on your website and then you use your botnet to click on your own ads and generate revenue for yourself. So it's really just an automated botnet that's doing the click, so it's called click fraud. Um, credit and electronic transfer, um, breaking into you know organizations, getting into their systems that do the uh, electronic funds transfers, uh, ACH, automated clearinghouse, 
um, and using those machines to do transfers to um, do small enough transfers so they don't get caught, right? A lot of times I use money mules there as well. This was done like uh, the town of Pittsburgh was, uh, was hacked uh, just last year. And what happened there was they sent some targeted emails to the financial officer for the town. Um, he clicked on the, the, the phishing, uh, compromised his machine, and then they got his password and used his password to set up transfers to money mules. Uh, and the money mules then transfer the wires, the money overseas. So they may be able to get a recover a small amount of it, but a lot of the tents did not get recovered. <clears throat> so that was a target attack on a small organization. And that's a big trend we're seeing. The bigger enterprises tend to have pretty good security. Um, so they say, hey, you know, these smaller businesses have enough money to make it worthwhile. Let's go after them. We'll do smaller transfers like five or 10,000, but we might do a dozen or more each day for a couple of days. And yeah, you know, I would get 100 grand out of the organization pretty quickly. You know, that's not bad pay for a team of four or five people. Um, targeted attacks on security organizations. They really are saying, hey, look, it, we can attack anybody and anybody, um, so we're going to go after the security organizations. And they go in after RSA and were successful. They went after HB Gary and they were successful, right? So the companies that um, say that, hey, you know, we know security, we're doing security, we can help you do security, they're getting hacked as well. So that says a little bit about where our industry is. You know, we're really not, uh, really not there yet. Even the, even the smart guys are, are falling for it. <clears throat> Any thoughts, questions? Can you explain pump and dump? And pump and dump, yeah. Um, basically what you do is you buy a stock at a low price, like a penny stock, and then you put out emails to say, hey, buy this stock, buy this stock. And the stock goes up just a little bit. But if it goes up from two cents to four cents, that's a huge increase, right? You sell it off <coughs> and you make a huge profit. <clears throat> Any other questions on that one? Not on that, but on the black market stuff and buy market stuff, have you seen people using the Bitcoin to buy and sell the services? Still using what? Have you seen people using Bitcoin to buy and sell the services? Bitcoin, um, so that's like a, a black market commerce site. There's several of them out there. I know uh, Brian Krebs in particular tends to get involved with them and report mm -hmm. on them. I don't think I've been to that one in particular though. Bitcoin, was that the name? Yeah, it's just, I okay. mean, it's almost like fictitious money. Oh, it's one of the e-money sites. Okay, so it's not a it's not a, a place for buying and selling. It's a place for getting electronic money, right? So it's not, not untraceable. Yeah, I mean, if you're selling credit cards, you're not going to accept a credit card as payment, right? <laughs> it doesn't work that way, you know. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm selling you credit cards. You're going to give one to me for, right? Um, so they tend to prefer the electronic money. Um, it's harder to trace. Um, also, it's you know, it's guaranteed because you have to put the money in the cash in up front. Um, there are some there are some crimes that have been caught that way though because they go to the, uh, the the site and say hey look at you know we know this you know crime was was done with your money can you trace it for us and they're not always successful with that but a few have cooperated and helped them catch the bad guys that way too what, I mean because that's part of their reputation too is right is, is if they're selling their e money as a way of being anonymous then that's why people want to use it was there another question it would seem easy for the credit card companies to go searching to buy fake credit cards and then bust the people selling them. Um, How do they get away with it? Well, so a lot of it's done online or remotely, right? And they can't catch them online? Yeah, well, you're, you're running your transactions through Anonymizer, right? So you don't really have an IP address. You can create big bogus logins. That or if you've got a botnet out there to do your transactions, there could be five million IP addresses to sift through to find the right one. Right, right. So there's, there's a lot of like, kind of hiding your tracks on the, on the network. <coughs> Um, what they do is they kind of see trends, right? One credit card starts having different trends in it, and they can find it that way. And that's kind of a point, too, is that when they're targeting these small businesses, when consumers get credit fraud and you call them up, they'll take it off and they, you don't have to pay for it. But when businesses get credit fraud or get um, bank account fraud, right, where it's taken out of their bank account, typically the banks don't give those businesses good protection, uh, and the banks can be out of the money, or the business can be out of money. Because uh, the, the businesses don't have the same protection against fraud that the consumers have. So uh, cyber gangs, I can talk about targeting small businesses, kind of got into that a little bit. Um, so again, they'll look for a financial officer, um, send a, a, a link to that officer, and the link will go to maybe a compromised legitimate web server, or might go to a web server that they've set up. Either way will work, right? Um, then the malware gets downloaded on the client system, the system's compromised, they set up a keylogger, grab the password, and they start doing the money transfers using that um, system. So again, um, you know, businesses don't have the fraud protection. Uh, they tend to not, so they can really lose a lot of money with this because the bank's saying, hey, look, you know, uh, it's your fault that your money got stolen. Um, 
So if they don't find it within two days, they might have like a two-day turnaround time, whereas consumers generally have like 60 days. <coughs> Where transfers rose 58% in 2008 and continues to rise today. All right, so let's talk a little bit about web applications. Um, why are they important? Um, you know, we've kind of gotten uh, accustomed to protecting the network, but the web applications are really much more complicated area. And generally, web applications are anything that does you know, HTTP or HTTPS, right? Um, generally, web applications are used by a user with a browser, but they also can be application to application, right? And we generally call that a web service. You have one web service, one web application talking to another web application. You know, maybe it's doing a money transfer service, or uh, you know, it's maybe a marketing service, or even a bulletin board service. There could be a lot of different things there. <clears throat> so typically, these web services might talk XML, so that's just better for automated programming versus a browser. Um, but a lot of the same vulnerabilities that are there for the browser is going to be there for the web services as well. But the web services tend not to get tested as well. People set up a web service and they say, well, you know, it's just another machine talking to our machine. You know, what's, what can go wrong? Well, there's a lot that can go wrong, right? Um, the attacker can, uh, you know, talk to that machine just as if it were another machine through proxies and other tools. Um, so these tend to be a really ripe area for vulnerabilities. So again, here we kind of show the, uh, the, the stack here, right? We've got the traditional layers. Um, <coughs> these are, uh, and we have traditional security controls for those layers, right? The network protocols, we have firewalls to protect those, right? To block the traffic that's supposed to be able to. We use VPNs, we use vulnerability scanners. This is kind of old school, we know how to do this, right? Operating systems, is kind of the next layer that's sitting on top of the, the network protocols. And the operating systems, <coughs> we fix those by patching them, right? Bringing them up to date configuring them to be secure, configuring the authentication authorization to be uh, appropriate for the operating system. We use encryption, and we can use automated vulnerability scanners to find problems with them. So all of this is old school, right? Uh, and even commercial open source applications kind of fit into the same area, right? Because we use the same vulnerability scanners for scanning them. So all of this is not application security, right? This is stuff we know, this is stuff we do, this stuff we do pretty well. But the thing with application security, it's a whole other layer on the stack and we really haven't learned how to do this well. And part of it is not just because we haven't learned it, because it's a whole lot more complicated, right? Um, the network protocols are fairly limited in number of protocols we use, so there's a lot of them out there. Operating systems are even more limited yet, right? Uh, commercial open source applications. But each application is a custom written application, right? So each one has specific vulnerabilities that you put in there as part of the architecture, the design of building that application. So these the application vulnerabilities are not something you can go out and say, hey, give me a patch for my application. No, you've got to patch your own application, right? If it's vulnerable. Um, and so this brings it into a whole new area of, uh, of complexity. <clears throat> so uh, just how bad is it when it comes to application security? Um, the Verizon Data Beach report uh, shows that application attacks are the number one attack. And this has been that way for several years. Um, typically, I find 92 to 100% of web applications are vulnerable in some serious vulnerability uh, once they're given a thorough test and thorough audit, and most of them are not. And I've, I've, you know, this is backed up by a lot of other statistics as well. Privacy Rights Clearinghouse, 93% of all data breaches involve applications or databases, which is really part of an application. Gardner says 75% of the attacks today are at the application level. Um, and actually, this is kind of cool that back in 2008, there was like a three month period where 90% of the malware actually came from legitimate sites, right? Now, how did we get malware from legitimate sites, right? Well, they compromised those sites, put the malware up there, and then used those legitimate sites to, for uh, distributing the malware. <clears throat> All right, here's a SANS, uh, the top cyber security risk report back in 2009. I'm showing kind of that same stack that I did, the network, operating system, and the applications. And um, the number of vulnerabilities goes up and up as you get in, into the more complex layers of the applications. So you have higher risk, more vulnerabilities um, in the application level than we ever have down at the network or less level. <clears throat> okay, so talk a little about some defenses. Web application uh, firewalls, WAFs, um, are one defense that's been developed for probably 10 years now. Um, they're different from traditional firewalls. They're not just blocking traffic based on uh, protocols and ports. They're actually looking at the HTTP content uh, and they tend to black, block the application attacks if they see something that's not what a normal browser would do or something that's a little bit unusual from what the normal application works. And these can be fairly complicated to configure correctly. 
And so generally, they're kind of configured at just a bare minimum level. So you can set them up, and they do a little more than a, a network firewall, but they're not doing nearly what they could be doing. And some of them are sophisticated enough, you could actually let them learn your application. So my application works, you go to this page, and then you go to that page, and then you go to one of these three pages, and then from there you go over to this one of these pages. So you can actually learn how your application works and enforce that flow through your application. Because the attacker's gonna say, hey, forget that, the good stuff's back here, I'm not gonna authenticate, I'm gonna go right ahead to access the application that's got the, uh, you know, the credit card numbers and social security numbers, and because I can do that without being authenticated, I'm gonna do that. Well, if your web application firewall knows that that's not the normal flow through your application, it could block that. Say, wait a minute, you know, you didn't log in. You can't go get there yet. So even if the application itself would have allowed that, the firewall can kind of learn the application um, and then pre prevent that because it knows that's not how the application works. Now, what's the problem with doing that? Anybody? Pardon? I'm sorry. Performance. Okay, a little bit, but even worse. Yeah, dynamic content is, is, is a big part of what I'm getting at. Um, go ahead. False positives. Yeah, false positives. I mean, applications tend to get used in little different ways, right? And if it didn't learn every possible way, it could block something that it doesn't want to. Also, every time you, train, you change your application, you've got to retrain this thing, right? So it's a lot of work to set up the first time. And when you set up the first time, you probably aren't going to get it right. So you've got to let it learn for a while, right? So I mean, it's a lot of work, but it can be some good security. So again, this is like, it's not nearly as easy as a, as a network firewall to set up and do right, um, but it can be done and it can help. Um, but it's not a silver bullet. The web application firewall by itself is only gonna block a percentage of the attacks. Um, web application scanners also help, but then these are automated scanners. They're gonna just um, generate values for the fields. And generally these are only gonna find a relatively small part of the vulnerabilities as well. They're gonna find the vulnerabilities that um, you know, an intermediate or low-level black hat is also going to find because they're going to use the similar kind of techniques. They're going to use automated techniques. <clears throat> so uh, other defenses, uh, and these are probably the stronger defenses, is, is to actually build security in your software development lifecycle. So educate your architects, your software designers, your developers on how to prevent these vulnerabilities. Help them understand the attacks, how the attacks work. Because um, sometimes when you're working with them, they say, well, why do I need to do that? And so you have to go back and kind of explain to them that, you know, well, just because a normal user goes through these pages doesn't mean you have to. I can put in a URL with a, with a session ID in it or something and go directly back to the back page and access stuff directly. And once they see those kind of things, they get a little more understanding of why it's important to, uh, you know, put in the proper security controls to the application. Um, so perform application architecture reviews and code reviews is very important. Um, and basically integrate security throughout your software development life cycle. Now this is kind of a radical change. Uh, it takes a fair amount of uh, change to how you, software is developed. And these days everybody wants to develop software, get it out there, it's internet time, right? It's gotta be done yesterday. Um, and so this gets to be hard for a lot of organizations to implement, but it really is, the, is one of the best approaches. Um, There's an organization out there, OWASP, OWSP.org, that has a lot of material and, and free tools as well. Okay, and basically OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project. Um, the idea is to provide free documentation and tools. Um, some of it's great quality, some of it's not so great, but hey, for the price you're paying for it, right? Um, so, and then, again, some of it is professional quality, not all of it, I have to admit. Um, but they're dedicated to helping people understand about web application security and why that's performed, why it's important. Um, they have local chapters in, in uh, a lot of places. I know we have one, have, have one in Rochester. Um, so I don't know if they have one down here. I think there's plenty of that. Any <coughs> questions? That, um, that WAF, the mm -hmm. web application file, is that something that would like, reside on your server? Um, it can. Usually it's a separate appliance. Um, like physical appliance? Yeah, usually a, a physical server in front of your other mm -hmm. server or an appliance on, on the network. Um, you, can, you can buy them both ways. Um, for an open source way off, there's, uh, Apache has mod security, which has uh, rules built into it. Um, so that's kind of a, uh, you could put an Apache with mod security and have that be in front of your other servers. It's kind of a reverse proxy or transparent proxy. Okay, some other documents, OWASP top 10. Um, their development guide is basically a guide for developers. They also have a tester guide for your testers. Um, and the Enterprise Security API is actually an API built to say, hey, look, at, you want to do authentication, you want to do it right, here's an API that will help let you do that. And of course, this has to be implemented in you know, both .NET, Java, all the major languages and platforms. Um, and they're working on adding more of those to that. Um, 
So they're make, trying to make it easier for the developers to do security right. The OWASP is also kind of well known for its OWASP top 10. So uh, every couple of years they go through and develop, uh, here's what we think are the top 10 risks currently to kind of raise awareness and education on those. And the current top 10, um, A1 is injection. So this includes like SQL injection, command injection, XML injection, all of that kind of get rolled into that one type of attack. Um, Cross-site scripting um, is when JavaScript executes inside of a browser, either from a trusted site, right, or uh, stored in, in, a, in a database. So it can be stored or reflected. <clears throat> Insecure direct object references. That sounds kind of uh, ambiguous, but basically, when your application allows direct references to like account numbers, um, file names, things like that, it's real typical in applications you develop and say, okay, look at, you know, we need them to select one of four things, right? And the four things that get selected might be an actual name or actual number. Well, the problem with that is there may not be any enforcement that will, what if I select something other than the four you expect me to do, right? I, accept, I select some other password, other file, like maybe the password file on the system, right? So, okay, let me, let me read the Etsy password instead of one of the four files you expect me to read, right? Uh, and if there's no enforcement, that direct object reference can be used to reference things that weren't intended to be referenced. Um, Cross-site request forgery is forging a request um, from a client who's already authenticated, right? So I'm logged into my bank, banking, banking website um, someone sends a cross-site request forgery that might cause my browser to actually change something in my bank. Maybe change my password, make a transfer, something like that would be a forged request. Um, but they didn't have to bypass the authentication, they just used my authentication because I'm already authenticated. Security misconfiguration, uh, that's kind of a really broad category of uh, not configuring your, your applications, your framework, um, your web server, um, your uh, application servers, framework, those kind of things. Insecure cryptographic storage. Again, not using cryptographic storage at all is the most common example I find. But also if you're using weak crypto or inventing your own, um, failure to restrict URL access. We kind of walked through a few examples of that, like bypassing the login page and going directly to what you want to access. If the application doesn't restrict that, that can be a major issue. Um, insufficient transport layer protection. This is SSL, okay? Not using SSL or not using it properly. Um, Unvalidated redirects and forwards. So a lot of times in the application, you want to be able to redirect the browser to another place, right? Um, and if that's kind of wide open, say, okay, have the uh, one part of the application type the URL and pass the URL as an argument to this redirect. Then the redirect will then redirect the user to that part of the other part of the application, right? Well, if there's no validation done there, I could have that application redirect to an entirely different website, right? <laughs> So I can bounce someone off a trusted website, have them land at an untrusted website, and the user doesn't even know it before things are sitting and downloaded and being run in the browser. Any questions, thoughts on those? Okay. Talk a little bit about how to do application testing. Um, for web application testing, one of the best tools is to have a proxy between your browser and the web server. 